Welcome to another episode of the Christian Combatives Podcast. I am your host and servant in Jesus Christ, Paladin Actual. This episode actually comes at the request of a brother pastor who asked if I would be willing to make a presentation explaining furries. Now, he asked for this because he, and certainly many other pastors, teachers, parents, And people in general are absolutely baffled by this topic. And for whatever reason, their seminary students, their seminarians, their vicars, their confirmands, their teenagers, their children keep talking about this topic. By some weird series of events, as I laid out in a previous episode, I've somehow become the resident Christian expert on this subject. This was not my choice, but okay, I'll run with it. Well, I've never been a furry myself, hanging out with enough of them for long enough has allowed me to observe some patterns that might be helpful to share. I'll also be talking about some psychological and sociological aspects that I've seen at play. And since I, of course, have a bachelor's in psychology, you can know that you can trust everything that I say and assume about the human mind, because psychology is at best a soft science and at worst, educated guessing. So I'm about as qualified to speak definitively about it as anyone else. For the first section, why should you care about this topic at all? Well, because this particular corner of the internet is full of people who are starved for the gospel. Many of them have never had a serious conversation with Christians if they're not a Christian already, and they desperately need your prayers and people who are willing to model Christ's love for them. I am neither ashamed of the gospel nor am I ashamed of sharing it with people who need it as much as I do. In this video, I hope to give a brief rundown for anyone not familiar with Christian furries, or furries in general, I suppose. Now, I understand that this is a bizarre topic, but if you're a parent, pastor, or teacher, the teenagers in your life are familiar with this topic, and they probably interact with this community, whether or not they like them. So you should be aware of who they are, and potentially why they are the way they are. I don't expect you to be comfortable with everything you hear in this video. If the concept of grown-ups and teenagers dedicating so much of their lives to fantasy or cartoon animals is strange to you, then join the club. But just because it is strange doesn't mean that it is necessarily sinful. And whether or not it is sinful doesn't mean that these aren't people that Christ died for, people who still need the gospel. So you are free in Christ to continue to think that this culture and the people involved in this culture are weird. You are not free in Christ, however, to hate them. Whether you consider them your neighbors or your enemies, God has commanded you to love both groups. After all, While we were still enemies of God, he died for us. If God is willing to die for his enemies, we ought to be willing to pray for ours. Let's start with scripture. Now, this wouldn't be much of a Christian guide to anything without including scripture in the matter. I don't feel that I really need to get into the passages that talk about sin. The wages of sin still is death, and the specifics of common sins in the furry culture are discussed at length in my only popular video on my channel titled, Is It a Sin to Be a Furry? Instead, first, I want to talk about what the Bible says about you and about furries and about what your obligation is as a Christian regarding them. Now, let's say your assumption about furries is that none of them are Christian, that it is impossible for a Christian to be a furry. All of them are horrible, rotten sinners. Neither a pastor nor any Christian should associate with any of them at all for any reason. Okay? You don't believe that it is possible for a Christian to be a furry. What does the Bible say about how you should regard unbelievers? First, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God commands his disciples, and by extension, the Christian church, to go out and reach the entire world, to teach the Christian faith to all so that all might be saved. If you believe that there is a group of people who are an exception to this rule, that you are to share the gospel with them, then repent. Furries are part of the whole world. Christian or not, God desires them to receive what he has given to his church to share with others, salvation and teaching. You are not excused from sharing it from them because they are sinners or because they are weird to you. The next verse I'd like you to consider is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says this, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Romans 10, verse 14 says this, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? The word of God certainly has gone out into the entire world, but if you believe that Christian furries need to repent, then the solution is to share the law and the gospel with them, to share God's word with them. Again, God doesn't give you a choice here to just withhold his gifts from the people you don't like, like 
Jonah going to Nineveh, for example, and withholding the gospel from people who aren't saved? Who exactly do you think the gospel was intended for? Ah, but they are enemies. They are enemies. Certainly they are enemies of God. They are enemies of the Christian culture. You should avoid them, right? Well, what does Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 say? But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Guess you have to love them anyway. And it is loving to share the law and the gospel, to pray for them. Whether they are enemies, whether they are neighbors, or whether they are brothers, you are commanded to love them. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So Jesus loved you while you were still an enemy of him. So you have to love others who you think are your enemy. Of course, I could keep going. Any verse about sharing the gospel or loving others condemns the idea that the weirdness or sinfulness of a furry precludes him from hearing God's word. I don't want to hear any more of this nonsense, this uproar, this outrage, that a Christian is sharing God's love with people online. Not that they are condoning sin or compromising the faith, but just that they are sharing the truth in love. If you don't like the Christian mandate to share the truth in love, take it up with the big man. I don't make the rules. So all of that stuff is general enough. Loving your neighbors, loving your enemies, loving fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Any decent pastor could tell you about that stuff. Who am I in particular to talk about the Christian furries, though? Well, I, it just so happens, in case you didn't listen, it just so happens that I recently made about an hour-long podcast describing how I went from bullying and, and tormenting furries online to becoming friends with a lot of Christian and even non-Christian furries. I'm a Lutheran pastor, I'm an army chaplain, and when I go online to talk to many Christian, and again non-Christian men and women about Christ, one of these groups, one of the many groups of people that I talk with online, is a Christian furry group on Discord. I help moderate their servers, I pray with many of their members, I talk with a lot of their members about personal struggles they're going with. I am not, nor have I ever been a furry, but that shockingly hasn't prevented me from appreciating how God has worked in their lives and sharing God's love with these people. Now, what is a furry? <laughs> that's, a, that's a more difficult question than you may appreciate. There are a billion definitions, but a functional one might be, furry is a title a person decides to call themselves to say that they have an interest in animals. A real animal, an imaginary animal, a cartoon animal, a stuffed animal, or even animal suits like you might see with sports mascots. This interest in animals is really the only uniting factor for everyone who calls himself a furry. Many of them might draw Many of them might not. Many of them might watch cartoons or make animal suits or wear animal suits or dedicate much of their life to raising animals or have an interest in anthropomorphic animals, any combination of these interests or none of them at all. And still a person might call themselves a furry. So even though someone might accuse another person of being a furry, it's usually used as an insult, like, <laughs> I saw you draw a cartoon animal the other day. You're a furry. <laughs> Something like that. It isn't actually a descriptive term. It isn't actually something that describes something. It's a statement of identity a person chooses to describe themselves. It isn't actually tied to anything like, like their biological sex or their humanity or anything like that. It's a statement about their interests. Consider possibly a comparable term, a metalhead. A metalhead might play heavy metal music. They might follow heavy metal bands. They might make up their own heavy metal logos. Or they might just like music. No amount of listening to the music or even playing it makes a person descriptively a metalhead, but they can choose to call themselves one if they, if they want to. So really, it's an identity based on an interest or a hobby. It's completely subjective. It's not a terminal diagnosis that people get. It's not something that they're infected with. It's not something you can detect on a blood test or an x-ray. It's not something that a person qualifies as by drawing too many Lion King cartoons. It's a self-assigned affiliation with either a singular interest or a collection of interests revolving somehow around animals. Anybody who has watched the news or any teenager on the internet has inevitably run into self-described furries. Almost certainly such reports and interactions have been negative and been an expression of clear and unabashed sin. In my video, Is It a Sin to be a Furry?, I went into detail about the kind of sin that is rampant in the community. I point out that having anything furry that is sexual in fantasy, in word, or in deed is sinful. Anything that is a rejection of the humanity that God has given you is sinful, such as claiming to be an animal soul and a human body. That is sinful. Anything where a person prioritizes this fantasy or this hobby to the extent that they neglect their duties, they idolize it, or they neglect self-care is sinful. I mentioned how these problems are present almost everywhere in the furry community, and that while it is present in other communities, furries are almost universally known for this sin in particular. Sin 
is sin. Sin requires repentance and forgiveness, and there's no excuse for it. But with all of this in mind, it is also possible that somebody calls themselves a furry and rejects that sin. That what they meant by the title furry is that they like cartoon animals. They like drawing or seeing drawings of cartoon animals. It could be Pokemon. It could be Warner Brothers. Maybe they like pinking the brain a little bit too much. Maybe it's Disney. Maybe it's any other number of sources. They just find themselves really attached to the idea. They like these cartoon animals. Again, this may or may not include dressing up or making costumes. There are plenty of people who go to Renaissance fairs, Comic Con, Star Trek conventions, if they still exist, and they dress up as their favorite characters or creatures from various games or movies or comic books or shows or their own imagination. It's similar to that where it's either some trademark character or some creation of their own. It turns out that some people like to express their creativity through making costumes or just enjoy dressing up in them for perfectly innocent reasons. So in such cases, again, I emphasize that sin is sin. There is no excuse for sin, and a Christian should avoid sin and repent of it whenever he commits it. At the same time, there are ways that people can enjoy these things and call themselves furries without embracing sin, but only embracing those things which are either neutral or positive. My advice to such people continues to be that I recommend you do not call yourself a furry. That title has so many sinful connotations attached to it due to the history and the present state of the culture, how, how the culture began and how it's known throughout the world, that it would be better for you just to appreciate the individual activities rather than claiming an identity, saying you like drawing or you like watching cartoons or you like making costumes rather than saying that you're a furry. So again, that would be my recommendation, not that it's a command from God or anything. But many people believe that the title of furry, while tarnished, can be reclaimed. In particular, there are Christians who believe that it is possible for them to live out their lives as Christians with these hobbies. That by claiming to be a Christian furry, they can retake innocent creative pursuits and enjoy them as someone who finds their primary identity in Christ. And that is the group that I wanted to talk about today. Again, Sin is sin, and the solution to sin is repentance and forgiveness. I am not endorsing sin in any way. Instead, I want to help parents, pastors, and teachers to understand the non-sinful aspects and hobbies that so many people participate in, and why something so weird to you might be so normal to them. This is the point in the video where I put on my psychology hat. Why are they the way they are? Now, this may be the most boring answer to that question, but in many cases, it's also the accurate one. Sometimes these odd people just enjoy these hobbies that you don't. Now, it can be difficult to fathom, but there are some people who like to play make-believe, who like to draw and watch cartoons, create intricate outfits, and even just dress up. Now again, though boring, this answer that furries act the way they do just for fun also explains why a lot of people do the things that they do. Turns out a lot of people like sports. I couldn't care one way or the other, but for them, it's because it's fun. There's no deeper psychological reasoning behind it. They just enjoy sports because it's fun to watch. It's fun to make fantasy teams. It's fun to cheer for players. It's fun to cheer for whole teams. It's fun to even play and dress up in the, in the jerseys uh, that, that, your favorite, that your favorite athletes wear. It's just fun. But those examples aside, where a person just does what they find fun, there are some common examples of behavioral patterns that are not based solely on preference and fun but rather they're based on certain choices that make the world more comfortable and social interactions feel more natural. While there are mental and social struggles in all communities all around the world, in particular there are a couple of common patterns in the furry community. Now if you do not personally struggle with any sort of mental or social variance or difficulty whatsoever, I can't ask you to see the world through the eyes of another person, but rather I ask you to please be sympathetic and patient because some people have some difficulties that you don't. Something I've learned from my experience with furries and Christian furries as well is the prevalence of autism and Asperger's in the community. For the sake of brevity, I'm just gonna to refer to it all as autism and you can fight over the distinctives in the comment section. Need I remind you, I have a bachelor's in psychology, so I'm basically a walking DSM. If you want to understand Christian furries, you're almost certainly going to have to understand autism. Not that every Christian furry has autism, but in all of their social interactions, they are almost certain to interact with other people who do. Autism affects the way a person perceives the world around them. There are a spectrum of specific conditions that a person with autism may or may not have, and they may or may not have in greater or lesser degrees. For example, for example, one beloved Christian that I know has an expression of autism where he is hypersensitive to light and sound. He cannot tolerate too much noise, music that you personally would not think is too loud, or too many people talking at the same time, too much noise going on at the same time. It's overwhelming to him. 
To him, it's as though the volume of the world is being amplified through a megaphone. His corrective to this is to actually have sound dampening headphones that he wears to bring the noise of the world to a tolerable level for him. He didn't choose to perceive the amplified volume, so would you fault him if he uses headphones to help him live in the same world that you do? Or in the same way that some people need glasses to see clearly, and some people need orthotics to walk without pain, and some people need dentures to chew their food, are you able to accept that some people can implement corrective tools to help them with challenges that stem from mental and social differences? With that mindset, consider some of the central aspects of the Christian furry. Now, while there are counterexamples, by and large, when I talk to members of the Christian Furry Fellowship, many of them tell me that they've been diagnosed with autism of some form and maybe some other conditions as well. Now, in the general population, there are far fewer people who seem to be diagnosed with autism than in the Christian Furry community, where it seems to be an overwhelming majority. Autism is often accompanied by comorbid conditions, sometimes personality disorders, developmental disorders, social disorders, but often it's just autism. So what does autism have to do with them being furries? What about their social awkwardness? The way that they communicate with smiley faces, emojis. They type out their emotions. Sometimes they say, smiles warmly or gets angry. The way they might want to overshare or say something rude and not realize that it's rude. This is extremely common with the Christian furry community from my experience. I'm again going to be speaking from my experience here. Sometimes it's role playing and goofing off, but many of them find that this is a much more effective way to communicate than to try to read the tone of someone's text which, again, anybody has difficulty with that, or to read the tone of somebody's voice. For me, if somebody is angry with me and I see them and I see that they look angry, I generally don't need for them to tell me that they're angry. But just like someone who might need subtitles to understand dialogue in movies, the furries often use subtitles for their emotions and social interactions. There's another condition to be aware of called alexithemia. It's often comorbid with autism. Alexithemia is a condition involving a lack of emotional awareness, difficulty describing feelings, and difficulty distinguishing feelings from physical bodily sensations. Now, I'll link in the description of the video below a few PubMed articles for you to read up on this condition if you'd like to, but the short version is that there is a barrier, a confusion, that is present with many of these people that you do not experience. Emotional and social awareness might be apparent for you, but if somebody struggles with these things, what is the best way for them to communicate? Well, many of the Christian furries I know found a solution by literally typing out or saying their emotions and their feelings. In the same way that you might say, my arm hurts, they might say, I'm feeling sad. This is perhaps part of the explanation to why they communicate the way they do, but at the same time, they also have a lot of fun expressing themselves in this alternative way. Anybody who's ever played a video game where a character can emote or dance or a tabletop game where each player has to describe their character's behavior may be able to appreciate that this can be an interesting break from the normal type of conversation that we often have. So okay, maybe that's why they communicate different than you do. Easy enough to understand, but why the cartoons? Why cartoon animals? What is the deal with these bright colors and giant eyed cartoon wolves? Well, I have a few more studies for you. I'll put in the video description as well. This time regarding autism and the perception of self image. Now, maybe I don't need to remind you, but one obvious answer is maybe they do this because it's fun. That aside, we should consider first what we've already talked about. If a person has difficulty reading the emotions of other humans or using their facial expressions themselves to present their own emotions, then being able to type them out or speak them will be a great help. But another way to communicate and understand such information is by simplifying the information when you present it or when you're trying to read it. Consider, for example, a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. It will likely take you at least a little while to put together the final image. And if you struggle with this kind of puzzle, you may never get it together at all. Now, if you're under a time constraint and you have to finish the puzzle in a few minutes, this might feel impossible, incredibly frustrating. You don't know how anybody could do it, yet so many people seem to be able to do it. This is incredibly alienating and discourages you from even trying. Now, consider that you've been given a four piece jigsaw puzzle. It's the same final image on the puzzle, but such a limited amount of ways that the pieces can go together make it so you can finish it almost instantly. Now you and the person with the 10,000 piece puzzle can both see the same image. Instead of a puzzle, let's say this is a human face. If you're like me, you've developed over the course of your life to be able to read complex human emotions in even the slightest detail on a human face. You look not just to the mouth or to the eyebrows, but maybe you look to the corner of the eyes. You want to see if a person's smile is sincere. You notice how frequently they blink, how they make or avoid eye contact, and you read all kinds of information instantly. 
Someone who struggles with recognizing emotion may never be able to pick up on these things or even replicate them. But if you have a cartoon image of a face with simplified features or exaggerated features and no details to overlook, then both groups of people can instantly recognize the emotion. The more exaggerated the features, the more simple the shapes, the fewer pieces there are in the puzzle to put together. So somebody who struggles with the complexity of facial expression will be more comfortable interacting socially if they can rely on these more simplified puzzles than the complex ones. Both might be equally easy for you, but just because you're good at a thing doesn't mean you should expect everybody is good at it. All right, so why cartoon animals? Why not just a whole community around big yellow smiley face emojis? The easy answer, once again, is that it's boring. It's fun for you to talk with different people who look different, have different mannerisms, different details, different features, different things that make them who they are. These details might be overwhelming for some people and imperceptible, while something too simplified might be too uniform. So the cartoon animals are the good middle ground for these. The neat thing about animals is how many there are and how vastly different they all are. A cat and a dog, a lion and a tiger, a wolf and a duck, a dragon and a dinosaur, or even something that you can make up from your imagination. You aren't stuck to a single style of emoji, but you have open license in creativity. As somebody who does a decent amount of drawing, I'll also know that drawing humans is hard, specifically real actual people. It is really hard. It's super easy to slip into the uncanny valley of drawing a human that doesn't quite look human. But if you draw an animal face and they look messed up, well, that's okay because animals often look messed up. You're not as used to looking at animal faces as you are human faces because you're talking with humans all the time when you're looking at their faces. If you draw a weird looking dog, maybe it's just a weird dog and that's what they're supposed to look like. For whatever reason, our brain is less likely to make that same assumption about a human. Well, of course, this person's eye is a little higher on one side than the other and a little bigger on one side than the other and, and, and maybe it's looking in a slightly different direction than the other. If you see that in a drawing of a human, you're less likely to say, oh, well, that's, that's just you know how a different person looks. If you see that in a drawing of a dog, you're like, oh, okay, that's a weird looking dog. This means that somebody can communicate fairly complex emotions with easily readable cartoon figures that are easier to draw than humans and diverse enough never to be boring. For added flair, you can make your creation your own by adding a wild hair color to it, while also relying on the pattern of the creature, a wolf or a dragon or whatever you base your drawing on. The final psychological aspect that I'd like for you to consider while trying to understand Christian furries is the fixation aspect of autism. I was informed recently that the term hyperfixation refers more to something that people with ADHD experience, but that an autistic fixation is something very different. An ADHD hyperfixation might be a present task that a person is working on that they cannot be distracted from, whereas an autistic fixation might be more long-term. Autistic fixations might include systems, an animal, or an object. Often it's something with defined parameters that can be studied and analyzed, maybe something that can be taken apart and put back together. Some very common autistic fixations are trains, military vehicles, fire trucks, Lego. Many with autism are fascinated by maps, by history, by mathematics, by theology, and other subjects with lots of details to learn and catalog. Still others will fixate on a fantasy. They'll see a character and this character will shape their identity. They might see Ryan Gosling and say, he's literally me every time that they watch a movie he's in. Or they might identify with a character from an anime and act as though they live in the world of Naruto. They might have a friend or family member whose life they idolize and they try to live out this life or copy it. Or they might create a fictionalized, idealized version of themselves and act to this avatar, whether we're talking about Dungeons and Dragons, World of Warcraft, or furries. This is why many might create a character who has traits that they aspire to be. To be lovable, to be approachable, to be confident, to be strong, to be smart, to be charismatic, faithful, any other number of things. In the Christian furry community, most of the members do this. They have a way that they represent themselves through a cartoon form. This helps them to see the world through the eyes of their character rather than being overwhelmed by trying to understand the complexity of their world alone. This helps them to communicate what they are feeling as well as to better understand the social interactions and the emotions of others. This allows them to express their creativity with confidence. Having a community of like-minded individuals, many with the same struggles and the same solutions, where common forms of expression and common tools are used for social interaction and for fun, allows this group of people to thrive and to support one another. 
Having Christ at the center and the foundation of it all ensures a group adherence to Christian morality, supporting others in repentance and calling out sin where it is present, sharing the law and the gospel in a way that can be digested without the overwhelming feeling of being the odd one out in the situation, in a group that doesn't understand their struggles. I am absolutely open to input and correction, and this is by no means an infallible or definitive explanation of the issue, but hopefully it's helpful to people to see this the way that I've come to see it myself. If after all of this there are significant additional questions, I might make a question and answer video, but barring that or some other sort of interesting enough drama, I'm probably going to pivot back to the other projects I'm working on. But in Christ, I'll ask you this. Please pray for those who need the faith who have few people who have tried to reach them with the gospel. Please pray also for those who have struggles that you don't, that they find ways to overcome these struggles and to find comfort in God's word. Please pray also for me and for everyone else who tries to understand misunderstood groups. This way I can avoid error, false understanding, and false teaching, and saying things that are perceived in the wrong way. In all of this, thank you so much, and God bless.